Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, today's presentation is on shoulder problem. This is the presentation that I recently presented, uh, I think a week or maybe two weeks back in, at CSM. Um, and this is uh, just part of a big presentation because uh, it was me, uh, Mark Brooks, and Rick McKibben. We presented uh, a talk together on decoding the shoulder problem with diagnostic tools, uh, which is EMG and ultrasound, uh, neural versus non-neural pathology. I mostly presented the non-neural part with a little bit of uh, a neural part where you can, um, talking a little bit about how you can uh, uh, scan the nerves around the shoulder area. So here we go. Um, so shoulder dysfunction is one of the most common reason why patients present uh, to physician or physical therapist office. And prevalence of one month of shoulder arm pain is reported to about 30%. There are 4.5 million visits per year related to shoulder, in, uh, shoulder pain in the United States itself. And uh, as we all know, I mean, most of you who are here uh, um, you have done in, uh, enough ultrasound and you know you, you've been in practice for long enough that you know that the, many times you do physical examination you do a good history taking physical examination but those special tests physical examination may not be enough uh, especially for this region which is a complex region um, uh, because the symptoms from the neck can mimic shoulder shoulder symptoms or vice versa, or you can have peripheral nerve entrapment like carpal tunnel syndrome, and pain can radiate proximally into the shoulder. So uh, so the uh, presentation can be confusing because it, 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 it presents like a similar presentation, uh, but pathology or structure responsible for um, that dysfunction or pain can be somewhere else. Okay, so we broadly classify uh, pathology uh, related to shoulder pain or weakness into two categories, neural and non-neural. And so looking at the neural, some of the uh, causes are listed here. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. There are uh, more causes that you can put under neural and non-neural. Uh, but in broad sense, if you categorize neural causes, you can uh, call, uh, categorize them into radiculopathy or neuropathy, uh, neuropathy of suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, long thoracic nerve, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, which is always very difficult diagnosis. It's always a difficult diagnosis. And parsonage turner syndrome, which is also known by many other names like uh, uh, brachial amyotrophy, neuralgic amyotrophy, uh, parsonage tunnel syndrome or acute uh, brachial neuritis. Uh, on the non-neural causes, which will be my main focus of the presentation today and the presentation focus at CSM, uh, can be rotator cuff tendinopathy uh, or subacromial impingement syndrome, partial tears or full thickness tears of rotator cuff tendons, tenosynovitis, um, subacromial subdeltoid bursitis because there are bursas, so many bursas in the shoulder region, uh, calcified tendinitis, joint effusion, arthritis with or without loose bodies, uh, frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, soft tissue mass or tumor. So there are many um, uh, pathology or structures which may be responsible for similar presentation. Now, I have tenosynovitis of long head of biceps tendon here. Tenosynovitis can only happen at those tendons which have um, um, the tendons that have uh, tenosynovium. For example, uh, distal biceps tendon does not have a tenosynovium, so you will never see tenosynovitis there. So if you see fusion around it, most likely that's bursa. So it's important to know uh, detailed anatomy of the structure, what can go wrong. So but, and as you're doing ultrasound, it's good to know that supraspinatus tendon at its insertion doesn't have tenosynovium uh, wrapping it or a sheath wrapping it. So you don't get, you don't hear tenosynovitis of supraspinatus or infraspinatus. Uh, long head of biceps tendon has a tenosynovium, so that can get inflamed, and that's why you get tenosynovitis. Oh, Haney, the Achilles also yeah. has a tenosynovium, yes. correct? That's a good point, yeah. Uh, Achilles does not have uh, tenosynovium. So you don't get tenosynovitis. Oh, I, thought it, I thought it did have. Okay. Oh, I thought you said it does not. No, I thought it did have. 
Okay. It has paratinone, but no tinosinovium. Usually, uh, tendons which are crossing any area or are subject to friction, that's where you will find tenosynovium around. So wrist, ha every tendon around wrist has tenosynovium because of movement in that area. Um, that's one of the reason. In shorter, I would say, because there are so many bursas, that's why not every tendon is wrapped around uh, tenosynovium. Uh, Okay, Roy is here and he asked me to unmute him. Okay, here you go, Roy. We can hear you. Hey. Hopefully now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, this is the same presentation that I presented at CSM, Roy, and uh, I have okay. used two of your clips here. Wonderful. Uh, um, so they'll be coming next. Yeah, so that that's an important... Uh, let's go back. Uh oh um, Yeah, so knowing anatomy and these subtle um, differences between different um, tendons uh, in terms of like if, if there's a sheath around it or uh, not, that can guide you into better interpretation of uh, uh, pathology. Okay, so majority of special tests in uh, uh, shoulder when used in isolation lack diagnostic accuracy. We know that. That's why we have clusters uh, for many things for different pathology like uh, um, in shoulder, in ankle. Uh, in different region, you will see there are there'll be diagnostic uh, cluster that we use. So um, out of five, if you have three positive, then you have 90% likelihood of uh, so-and-so pathology. Uh, somebody raised the hand here. Um, Raji wanted to be unmuted. I think I unmuted, unmuted you and you show self muted on my side. Okay, so now I'm going to go um, over some of the special tests that we use for shoulder examination and uh, what are the specificity and sensitivity of these tests. So spoiling tests. So let's look at the neural uh, causes first. So for radiculopathy, we use spoiling tests. And um, it has sensitivity of 30% and specificity of 93%. And based on a systemic review, there is limited evidence for accuracy of uh, physical exam tests for the diagnosis of cervical radiculopathy. And we know that you now positive or negative uh, spoiling test may not help you much. So now going forward, when you see uh, next few slides, you will see that most of the um, uh, most of the special tests have good positive likelihood ratio, but not so good negative likelihood ratio. Which means if they're positive, you're more confident. So let's look at the um, special test for shoulder pain or impingement, like Hawkins Kennedy test. Uh, likelihood ratio positive, likelihood ratio 1.84, and negative is 0.35. Uh, sensitivity of 80% and specificity of 56%. Uh, so is true for the near test, uh, positive likelihood ratio of 1.79 and negative 0.47. Uh, it's not great positive likelihood ratio, but it's better than the negative one. So when a uh, patient is positive uh, with these special tests, uh, you are thinking about, okay, this patient has impingement, but when I show you case examples, and you're probably thinking about some of your tests, um, that's not always true. There may be several reasons or pathology responsible for shoulder pain, and they can give you false positives or false negatives. Now, for slap lesion, um, there are so many special tests, but not every test is so useful. Uh, but there are two which, uh, based on literature, uh, are more useful than others. Uh, for example, modified uh, dynamic labral shear test um, has a nice positive likelihood ratio of 31.57 and negative li likelihood ratio of 0.29. So when it's positive, you are confident that most likely there is a slap lesion, but if it's negative, it decreases the likelihood ratio only to a small extent. So it's possible that there is slap, there is still slap lesion. It's just that you cannot rule that in. Uh, that's what it means, negative likelihood ratio of 0.29. Same is true for passive distraction test. Um, 
positive likelihood ratio of 8.83 and negative of 0.5. So again, if it's positive, everything is uh, it looks everything looks good. But if it's negative, you're in that gray zone where you're not sure uh, if if that problem is still there or not. For instability, um, again the same trend: better positive likelihood ratio and negative uh, not so good negative likelihood ratio. Uh, but for anterior app, uh, instability, we do apprehension test. Um, and if it comes uh, negative, then you can add relocation test, and that can improve its negative predictive value. So you can follow the follow apprehension test with a relocation test, and um, that'll help with uh, ruling that in. Now, moving on to rotator cuff pathology, uh, isometric rotator cuff strength testing is the most common assessment, but there are many other factors that you have to take into consideration. For example, age. As men age, their abduction, abduction, and external rotation strength decreases, whereas as women age, their abduction strength decreases, but external rotation strength is preserved. So these are normal uh, uh, changes that you should expect with aging. Uh, there is also a typical age progression of rotator cuff tears, which you also have to keep in mind. And uh, there is incidence of an asymptomatic rotator cuff tear with aging. So when you are scanning or when you are um, assessing someone for rotator cuff pathology, you cannot just rely on isometric strength because they may be weak, but there can be several reasons why they can be weak. Maybe it's a neural cause, and maybe they have radiculopathy, which is responsible for that disease, or they have they don't have that tendon. It's absent, or it's there is full thickness tear, or partial thickness tear. That may be the reason why they're weak, or it can be a normal age progression. Uh, fourth um, condition can be so I said. Um, First thing is uh, neural cause where there is radiculopathy for, responsible for the weakness. Number two is complete tear of the tendon. Number three is partial tear. Number four can be um, uh, that they there's their normal age progression and they are weak. For example, men in external rotation as they age, are they going to show decrease in strength? Or it can be they, they may have a asymptomatic rotator cuff tear which is giving positive test on isometric rotator cuff strength testing but is not the main problem so you understand that you know there are strength testing cannot be only relied on uh, if you are assessing someone for a patient for rotator cuff pathology because there are many reasons why a person can be weak in one group of muscle versus other um, now, there are other tests, belly off tests, which we use for uh, subscapularis tendon um, tear. If it's positive, then you are, uh, that strongly supports that there is subscapular subscapularis tendon tear. Uh, but if it's negative, it doesn't completely rule it out. If there is still po it's, it's possible that they still have subscapularis tear. So what you can do in that case is you can scan that patient when you have negative test and that that will help solve that problem that you can see if it's intact or not, if it's partially torn or completely torn. Now, external rotation lag sign is a good test, a good clinical test, and it evaluates uh, for the presence of full thickness supraspinatus or infraspinatus tear. But it, it is not a good test for partial thickness tear. So if supra and infra are partially torn, that's not a good test to uh, to help you uh, with that uh, diagnosis and um, however if it's positive then you are very sure that there is full thickness tear of supra and infra so that's what you get out of external rotation lag sign um, now if you have three positive findings age more than 39 year old uh, self-reported popping and clicking and painful arc of motion, the likelihood of supraspinatus tendinopathy in these uh, settings uh, increases uh, likelihood ratio to 32.20. So we always um, assess 
the findings uh, in combination of like history, special test, uh, presentation of the patient, and some important findings like you know your age, and if they are reporting popping or clicking or painful arc of motion. So nothing is uh, evaluated in isolation. So you don't just rely on physical exam or uh, just the ultrasound scan or just the EMG, everything has to be put into perspective and uh, you have to do a clinical correlation if that makes sense or not. Now, as far as imaging of rotator cuff is concerned, for partial thickness tear, MRI and ultrasound are equally good. And for both partial and full thickness tear, uh, there is no significant differences in performance of MR, MRI, MR arthrography, and ultrasound. And as we all know, ultrasound is cost-effective, non-invasive uh, compared to MR arthrography. For slap lesion, um, imaging is not that great. It's less accurate, even MRI. Um, so, so what do you do with slap lesions? You do a good physical examination, good history taking and physical examination, and look at the combination of finding especially um, two uh, physical exam tests, active compression and passive distraction test. If they are positive, then it's better to do MR arthrography to confirm the slab lesion. So your first approach is to do a physical exam and um, see if these two tests are positive and then follow that up with MR arthrograph. Um, just going straight for MRI is not going to help. And ultrasound, because it does cannot see the intra-articular pathology, uh, it may not give you, um, uh, it may not be helpful in ruling that in, but there are some indirect signs that you can pick up with ultrasound. Um, you can see effusion abnormality of long head of biceps tendon, or you can rule out other possible causes. So um, ultrasound helps you ruling out other possible causes of uh, shoulder dysfunction, and there are indirect signs that can point towards that. Um, now, combining history and physical examination improves accuracy, as we I have repeated uh, many times before. Uh, combination is better than combination is better than imaging tests. So we don't want to just do imaging, just jump at imaging. You want to do a good history taking and physical examination. And then, and then follow that up with imaging test. And the beauty of ultrasound is that you can do it real time. Um, and you can include any physical test, uh, special test, and uh, put the transducer on the area and see how the structures are moving, what, what's their relative movement. Sometimes patients can compensate. But if you add ultrasound to your physical exam test uh, or special test, you can see if uh, the structure of interest is moving or it's just the compensation. And I'll show you some um, uh, clips for uh, to, uh, to further elucidate that point. Um, there are certain limitations also. So we need to understand uh, what tests to pick. Uh, for that, you need to have a set of uh, probable differential diagnosis already. So based on your uh, examination, you have to have a differential diagnosis that you want to rule that, rule out or rule in. And for that, you can use EMG and ultrasound. And you can pretty much, you know, I think for uh, other than uh, systemic causes or um, other um, uh, non-musculoskeletal, uh, neuromusculoskeletal causes, you can, you can diagnose every possible uh, neural or non-neural cause of shoulder problem. So here is this evidence-based shoulder evaluation, um, a very good article published in current sports medicine um, journal. And they have a very good algorithm. And uh, as you can see, this is not intended for patient present presenting with shoulder pain in systemic illness or risk factors. So of course, we're not including someone who has night pains and um, other red flags. Uh, this is uh, for mechanical or <coughs> musculoskeletal um, related uh, shoulder problem. So if there is a trauma, you have to do an X-ray to uh, rule that out, to rule out fracture or dislocation, and then follow that with apprehension and relocation tests to rule out anterior instability. 
if there is no trauma then the next question you ask is if the patient is more than 50 50 years old uh, if they are more than 50 year old then you have to do an x-ray to rule out osteoarthritis which gives you a good good global view of the shoulder um, of uh, of the bones and articulations and after x-ray you have to follow that with belly off external rotation lag and um, abduction test uh, that and these tests you're doing to rule out any rotator cuff involvement and depending on what uh, result you get and you can follow that with ultrasound they say mri or ultrasound um, it makes sense to add ultrasound because it's uh, uh, more uh, cost effective than MRI to rule out rotator cuff tears. If the age is less than 50, then you do shrug sign. If the shrug sign is positive, then, then you are trying to differentiate between arthritis or adhesive capsulitis. If shrug sign is negative, then you have to do the Test, special tests for slap lesion, active compression, passive distraction, modified labral shear test. Um, and if they are positive, then you follow that with MRA arthrogram, um, MR arthrogram to rule out slap lesion. If the patient's age is th uh, more than 39, and they remember those three signs, age more than 39, popping and clicking, and uh, painful arc uh, motion, then most likely you're looking at rotator cuff, cuff tendinopathy. But this rotator cuff tendinopathy here in this box is a very big box because there is so much that can fit inside this. And um, so many of us, I know so many people, ha uh, they have they had some great cases in the past uh, year or two or three or more than three years, uh, especially looking at your ultrasound reports. Uh, you can call everything under the umbrella of rotator cuff tendinopathy, but it could be a, a bursitis with severe effusion of the bursa. It can be calcific tendinitis. Um, it can be just tendinosis or an acute tear. So there, there is a, there's a lot that, that can uh, fit under this umbrella of just rotator cuff tendinopathy. Um, so, Ultrasound is rapidly growing point of care assessment tool, which has its application in not just PT, but all other disciplines of healthcare. And it is, when it's appropriate and uh, indicated, effective use can eliminate unnecessary cost of imaging, and it can provide insight into pathophysiology of the shoulder problem. So um, I don't have to tell you <laughs> this was meant for CSM audience. Uh, we know, we all know that it's a real, real time evaluation. It's time saving, it's cost saving. Uh, there is greater patient satisfaction reported with the use. Um, it's, it can be safely uh, used in almost everyone, even people with um, uh, metallic implants, ORIF, um, or any other implants, there there are no contraindications, except you know if you're doing it on the open wounds, and even that you know you can do use the sterile gel uh, and get the clearance. But uh, just other than common sense, there are no uh, absolute contraindications for ultrasound comparison of contralateral structures. You can easily do that. Now I like to always uh, point this article out because this is a great article which was published by uh, AIUM. And Levon Nazarian is a, a musculoskeletal radiologist who is editor-in-chief of Journal of Ultrasound and Medicine. And this is a musculoskeletal radiologist who writes 10 reasons why ultrasound should be used as an important complementary or alternate techniques to MRI uh, because every patient can undergo sonography. So I, I have listed 10 points that he states. And then, you know, of course, he writes a little description for each of these 10 points. But the point is, every patient can undergo sonography. Ultrasound can resolve finer details than MRI. That is especially true for nerve imaging and tendon imaging. The fibular structure that you see with uh, um, ultrasound, you cannot see that work with MRI. So, so is true uh, for nerve, the fascicular arrangement of the nerve that you see with ultrasound, you don't see such details 
with MRI. Now with three Tesla MRI, they are coming up with something like MR neurogram and they, they have to pick special pulse sequence to enhance that. But there is, it is much more involved. You know, not every place has that. Not every radiology radiologist is um, familiar with that. So, um, so there is, uh, if there is any ultrasound of uh, within the range of 13 to 17 or 10 to 16 megahertz can resolve these details. So you don't need a super special probe to look at those details. Uh, it's real time, so you can do dynamic examination as you're examining the patient, and there is a great value in that. Uh, ultrasound probe can be put exactly where it hurts. It's not restricted by views uh, like uh, MRI and X-rays are. Uh, you can do uh, you can do ultrasound on patient with surgical hardware. Um, Doppler ultrasound gives us good information, like if there is any vascularity in the region or um, neoangiogenesis uh, of the, especially in the tendinous tissue, um, tendon tissue. Uh, ultrasound is great in differentiating fluid from solid material. If something is solid or fluid, we can tell it very easily with ultrasound. It's good for guiding therapeutic intervention, and it's great to uh, do a bi bilateral comparison. So if you're doing a right shoulder scan and you have to quickly do a side-to-side -side comparison for, let's say, long head of bicep tendon, which looks really thin for some reason on one side, you can quickly assess it with the other side, check it um, compared with the other side, and uh, it doesn't take uh, um, a lot of time to do that. Um, it has more flexible field of view. What does this mean is, so uh, for nerve imaging, nerve is not traveling in just straight linear course. It courses around, um, for example, the nerve, uh, let's say radial nerve, it's on the, uh, the groove on the humerus and then it moves anteriorly and it's traveling between different fascial planes. So if you try to capture the course of the nerve with other imaging modalities, it's hard because it's not going in one perfect coronal or sagittal plane. But with ultrasound, because you have flexible field of view, you can follow the nerve with your probe. So you're aligned with that one specific structure and you can scan it much better. So that's the value of ultrasound. Um, now move to the next slide. Okay, now I don't have to go over this. You all know the terminologies of ultrasound. We can pretty much define everything with hyperechoic, hyperechoic, anechoic. Um, then there are other terms like isoechoic. Um, yeah, isoechoic other than that. And then we use other terms like heterogeneous or homogeneous. Uh, but yeah, the very limited terminology, but you can define everything with this. Uh, in shoulder, we do systematic comprehensive assessment. And it's very important to do that because uh, there are a lot of indirect signs that you pick up on your way. So there is an article um, in uh, the Physician and Sports Medicine uh, Journal, and they gave this guide to shoulder ultrasound. And they are uh, like other uh, sources, like European journals or European protocol, uh, every article suggests that you have to follow a systematic pattern. And, and all of you are familiar with the shoulder ultrasound or ultrasound of other regions, especially in shoulder, we like to start everything with long head of biceps tendon, moving to subscap, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, AC joint. And that's because as you're moving from long head of biceps tendon to subscap to supra, one structure leads to another. And... Uh, on as you're moving from this systematic approach, you're picking some indirect signs. So let's say you, first structure that you study is long head of biceps tendon, and which is this one here, and, and you find some fluid around the tendon here, around the tendon in the group. Now, when you see that, what should come to your mind? The first thing is that. I have to look at the supraspinatus very well because this means that there is likely a tear in supraspinatus. Or it can also suggest, uh, suggest slap lesion, which you may not see because it's intra-articular, but that's one of the <coughs> sign. Um, so let's go back one more slide. Yeah, so long enough biceps tendon, 
Then we do ask patient to do external rotation. So that's subscap, supraspinatus, rotator interval. Um, there are some um, uh, advanced scanning that we cover in mentorship and fellowship module, uh, but I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, in the next two, three slides. Rotator interval is very important um, area and structure, which is important for stability of shoulder and biomechanical functioning. Um, of the shoulder and uh, has important implication in frozen shoulder or uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis. Then on the posterior side, we have infra teres minor and again going on the lateral side, uh, acromioclavicular joint and uh, subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So we all know this is how the bicep tendon sits in the groove between lesser tubercle and greater tubercle. You ask patient to do external rotation, you bring the lesser tubercle over to the right and super uh, subscap comes into the picture that subscap attaching to lesser tubercle then we move to supra uh, bird beak view uh, you see the um, greater tubercle and then the head of the humerus uh, now it, within the same region if you move a little bit anterior from supraspinatus you are in a region which looks like you know you know you when you you have probably crossed this many times when you're scanning uh, you just never paid attention but you were in rotator cuff interval as you move between uh, lhp view to supraspinatus view that's the region of rotator interval so rotator interval is uh, is the area which is present on the anterior superior aspect of glenohumeral joint Externally, it is reinforced by corecohumeral ligament and internally by superior glenohumeral joint. So this light blue and this little bit darker blue, that's that's the region of rotator interval. And it has long head of biceps tendon within it. So the fibers of corecohumeral ligament and superior glenohumeral ligament form this um, region. This is on the left, on the bottom left side. This is the image of rotator interval. So you can see that's the long head of biceps tendon, kind of like an oblique of the tendon. You're not perfectly short on it, but the fibers that are on top are corecohumeral ligament. The one in the bottom is superior glenohumeral ligament. And this is an important area. When you have someone with the frozen shoulder initial early stages, this is the area where they are tender and you will see vascularity in this region. So. We're not going to elaborate on that. We just wanted to point that out. OK, now going posterior infraspinatus. So I have put one image over the other because I wanted to see show you the continuous muscle tendinous junction to insertion. So here is GT, posterior um, tubercle, uh, greater tubercle. And so this is the footprint of the infraspinatus tendon. And as you go right, you can see the tendon transitioning into muscle fiber. So you have a little bit of tendon, a little bit of muscle. And here you see the glenoid labrum, which is lo which looks like a hyperechoic triangle here. Um, so it's important to, to scan from muscle to tendon or whichever way you like, but make sure you always go over the joint uh, because that gives you the confidence that you are on the correct muscle. Uh, Infraspinatus is directly over the posterior joint. So this is post uh, infraspinatus going to its insertion site here. And this is where you can find abnormality in the posterior um, uh, shoulder joint. And so this is the posterior sh shoulder joint. This is glenoid and the notch, which is not in the focus here. This is the notch where suprascapular nerve sits. This is the AC joint. You all know that. Now let's go over some of the example. Now these are going to be the simple example. So this is a normal looking supraspinatus uh, tendon. So that supraspinatus looks like bird beak. Um, that's flatter part is the greater tubercle, GT, the uh, junction between the tubercle and the head. And you see the rounded appearance of the bone is humeral head. So this is the short axis view. This is the long axis view. Uh, this is skin, subcutaneous tissue, deltoid, bursa, tendon, and then bone 
and you can see the cartilage here. So this is how the normal tendon looks. This is how focal tear appears. You have see a focal defect in the tendon, hypoechoic initially, and fill up later on with the scar tissue or like randomly arranged collagen, so that can be disorganized. But it loses its normal fibrillar pattern, loses its normal uh, contour. So uh, that's how you know it's a tear. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time because I know everyone is familiar with this. Uh, bursal sided tear, because this is on the bursa side. Deltoid, this is bursa, and that's the tendon. And you can see cortical irregularity, so that's indirect sign that there is some type of tear here, because there's always some type of avulsion type uh, tear uh, associated with uh, partial tears of uh, rotator cuff. Intrasubstance tear, a focal defect within the tendon. Uh, does not communicate to the articular side or the bursal side, and that's why you don't, you, can, you may miss them in um, if if the patient is getting MR arthrogram because the dye does not make it there. Full thickness tear. Um, I know Roy has seen many, many. For some reason, he has great shoulder uh, cases um, uh, because there are there are so many. Uh, full thickness tear that uh, I think Roy has seen so far. Uh, so this is. Uh, full thickness tear and you can see there is no tendon attached here. Uh, this is uh, chromium um, and that's head of humerus and GT doesn't look good. Um, and so that's, uh, you can see the same, uh, you can confirm the same on the short axis. You don't see any tendon here. This is just deltoid overlying the bone. You can see a little cartilage interface sign. So you can see a little bit of uh, fluid collected here. Um, so that's the example of full thickness tear. Now, we, uh, we know the difference between tendinosis and tendon tear. Uh, if there is tendinosis, the tendon will be thick, hypoechoic, heterogeneous, ill-defined. Uh, that's because of the mucoid degeneration. And in tendon tears, there is no one specific appearance that you can see. But if it's acute, you will see a well-defined focal defect in the tendon. If it's a little bit later on that you're scanning that patient, that you may not see a nicely defined focal defect, but it may be more like a hypoechoic region. Um, uh, there'll be loss of fibrillar pattern. And um, there may be thinning of the tendon because you're losing the uh, fibers, uh, tendon fibers. So there is a thinning of the tendon. Uh, sometimes in chronic partial tears, you only see thinning. You don't see much because uh, the torn fibers are attracted proximally. The ones that are intact, um, they look near normal. And uh, you may see some cortical irregularity. So uh, presentation can uh, vary from uh, patient to patient. Uh, now, this is example of calcific deposit in supraspinatus. So that's the deposit here, white cloud that you see in long axis and the short axis. So this is what I was telling you. In rotator cuff pathology, there are so many things that, in, that can fit under that umbrella. So this patient may also present like rotator cuff uh, or subacromial impingement type of presentation. Uh, but this is different. You know, you will give a different, uh, your patient education will change, your treatment will change. Uh, it may not significantly, but you know that if someone has a um, very painful deposit calcific tendonitis, you can assure the patient that this is a uh, this condition is self-limiting and this is the phase you have to. Um, uh, it's, it's reassuring for the patient that this is something temporary and it's going to heal itself. And as the calcium gets absorbed, you're, they are going to feel better. Um, so that's why uh, you scan the patient so you get more information. Uh, the more you know, the better you treat them, the more the patient knows they are better able to manage uh, their condition and they have confidence in the provider. Okay, now long head of bicep tendon. Here in this case, there is tenosynovitis. So you can see the tendon itself is hypoechoic and there's hypoechoic signal around it, which also shows color signal on uh, color Doppler. Uh, so the, the tenosynovium around is inflamed. If you see anechoic focal regions where the fluid is collected, we call that effusion. So some people have asked this question uh, in the past, that um, how do you differentiate? So if, if there is a fluid, uh, you may see it on one side the, or the other. Uh, and um, uh, this fluid is going to be more localized, more cyst-like appearance. And 
so that's effusion around the long head of biceps tendon sheath. But if, if it's diffusely hyperechoic around and uh, the flu fluid does not move um, and the tendon fibers look hyperechoic, uh, um, then it's most likely tenosynovitis. Uh, and the most important indication is if you put on the color Doppler and you see vascularity, that then you know for sure it's tenosynovitis. Sometimes they can be hard to differentiate when it's like diffuse effusion, yeah. not cyst-like effusion. Uh, but you, if make sure to use your power Doppler or color Doppler on ultrasound. Okay, so now let's look at the dynamic uh, shoulder abduction and see how the tendon so uh, how the tendon moves. So this is a chromion here. And that's GT. You can you don't see head of humerus because it's right here, but you see a little bit of supraspinatus. Right above supraspinatus, this is the bursal lining. There's no fluid, so you don't see anything. Above that is deltoid. Okay, so let's do top-down approach. So you have skin, subcutaneous tissue, deltoid, bursa, supraspinatus, humerus. If you go from down to up, if you like that, then bone. GT and um, head of humerus, supraspinatus, bursa, deltoids, subcutaneous tissue, skin. This is a chromium. You have to always keep that in the view. So now the patient is moving into abduction, and you will see everything sliding under the chromium, nicely tucked. And you can see the deltoid uh, thickness has increased. Uh, so it has uh, the girth has increased because it's contracting. So first 15 degrees you get from supraspinatus and then uh, deltoid and the trapezius. So we are not doing full abduction, but uh, you can see the initial movement. Uh, supraspinatus slide under the chromium. Everything is nicely tucked under. And you can see the deltoid curve has increased because it's contracting now. OK, so that's normal dynamic examination. Now, if someone has pain and they cannot do anything, they are in excruciating pain, like 10 on, pay, 10, 10 on 10 pain or 11 on 10 pain. And you do special tests, you do empty cam and um, Hawkins cam. Everything is positive because they are just so sensitized. You cannot reliably check their isometric strength or any special test. Um, or maybe they are holding their arm and they are not able to do any movement, any elevation. Um, what do you know just based on your physical examination or uh, your assessment? I don't think that in that case you know much, but if you add ultrasound, you, you know if something is intact or not. For example, this patient presented, um, one of the patient, he was in excruciating pain and uh, uh, his pain, uh, he, he couldn't move his shoulder in any direction. Um, and because uh, he wasn't moving it at all, uh, we weren't sure if uh, this patient uh, had a full thickness tear or um, most likely you were thinking maybe like he, he tore something. But look at the scan here. Look at the effusion of subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So this is because, you know, you cannot, we could not, I could not get this patient into a um, um, uh, position for middle cross position for supraspinatus scan. So you can see I only get a little bit of beak. So this is the GT and that's starting to show the head of humerus, but you don't see that nice bird beak. But you see enough to say that there is tendon intact here. But look at the fluid here. You, you don't see a chromin because a chromin is somewhere here, but it's pushing the soft tissue on top and bottom so much because there's so much of fluid here. So this is deltoid. That's the bursal lining, um, top lining, and the bottom lining. And this is supraspinatus. So this is long axis view, short axis view. Now, asking the patient to give you to give you a little bit of movement. So I did not, I don't have a clip for this patient, but when I ask him to move whatever he can give me, look with that little movement. So the fluid was pushed out into the subdeltoid region. You can still see the supraspinatus. There was no way it's, it's gliding under the chromium. So I, I had I overlapped these two images to show you because I have two images. I took uh, at a chromium and a little bit distal. Uh, so this is a chromium. Uh, you can still see supraspinatus. That's the humerus, the whole humerus here. And look at this balloon, a cystic distension going all the way on the lateral side. This is all deltoid muscle. So that's that's a lot of pressure. So, but it's. Uh, you know this patient is not going to do immediately well with conservative 
in the long run, yes, but maybe this patient needs something for quick pain relief and uh, something for this effusion, large effusion. And after that, but it's reassuring for patient that you know they did not tear something or there is no full thickness tear or something um, that needs surgical intervention. Um, so that's that's the value of adding uh, imaging ultrasound imaging study here. Now this is uh, a case example of someone presented. Uh, now this is a courtesy from Brian Cochran, uh, one of his cases. Um, patient presented a 50 year old female 9 on 10 pain and she couldn't move the arm and as brian said the patient uh, had a husband come with her because she could not even hold her uh, pocketbook um, this is what brian found um, look at the hyperechoic structure here so this is the long axis on the right side this is the short axis on the left uh, there is hyperechoic signal here so do you know if there is supraspinatus here or not First of all, do you think? What do you think of this uh, um, case? Do you see the tendon, or what's wrong with it? When you first see it, uh, what is the first thought that comes to your mind? I think it can't, can't see the tendon at all. Yeah. What, what's that? Uh, uh, say it one more time. Sorry, I missed it. Oh, Janine wrote full thickness there. Uh, and anyone else? Oh, like I said, I just see change in contour or drop. And when you look at the short axis, it's definitely, we're lacking it. It's flattened down, so it stands out in itself. How about the oh, the long axis view on the right? Bottom? I'm trying to see on my, on my computer, I'm having a hard time seeing the oh. quality of the size of it. So it's. Well, Haney, is that some cortical irregularity right there? It looks like that. Yeah. Now, so you made good observation. Okay, so it looks like cortical irregularity. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's no supraspinatus because you see the supraspinat, uh, sorry, deltoid muscle here in the short axis. And then you see the bone, you see mm -hmm. the long axis deltoid, and you see the something that looks like bone. But actually, we are not seeing at the, not seeing supraspinatus here because mm -hmm. you see this hyperechoic, which you call uh, bone with cortical irregularity. That's actually a massive calcific deposit. Wow. A massive. So we we don't know if if beneath this calcific deposit, if there is supraspinatus intact or not. Most likely, it is because it looks like it's lining the supraspinatus. So in short axis view, look at this step off. So you see this hyperechoic line, which looks irregular, right? Mm -hmm. And then you see this little another bone here. So this okay. faint looking hyperechoic interface is actual humerus, true humerus. This structure is not humerus. It's just a calcific, massive calcific deposit. Wow. So there's a calcific deposit right under the deltoid. And now look at the long axis. So long axis, you can see this is long axis because deltoid, long fibers, right? You can see the muscle. You can see hyperechoic something here, but this is not humerus because this is humerus here. That's the GT. Right. This one is the GT and somewhere here should be the head, but we cannot see the head because this block of calcium is blocking it. But look at the patient after one month. I'm only sure, uh, I only have long axis here, but look at this. Can you see the tendon now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a tendon yeah. here, cleared up in one month. But look, look just above the tendon. Look at this. Uh, uh, so this is deltoid, right? Everyone agrees, yeah. right? And just, just above the bone is supraspinatus. Between the deltoid and supraspinatus, do you see this diffuse hyperchoic something here? That's uh, thickened bursa. And you can still see a little calcific here and here, but the patient is much better at this stage. And look at this nine months later, almost totally cleared out. So this is long axis on the right. This is short axis on the left. A little bit here, a little bit hyperechoic calcific deposit, a little bit here, but at this stage, the patient is completely pain-free. Uh, so um, there is there are some tears here, but it's, it's intact. Supraspinate is intact. Uh, yeah. Whenever there is calcific deposit, there, there, most like there is some um, 
degenerative changes or partial focal tear that happened in the past because a healthy looking or healthy tendon uh, with everything intact doesn't usually have calcific deposit. Um, the molecular environment for calcium to be secreted cells happens after some type of fiber failure or degenerative changes. So, the, um, of course, this after, even after it clears out, completely clears out the uh, calcific deposit, the tendon is not going to look normal because to begin with, it wasn't normal, but it can function normal. So, yeah, so that's, so if you scan patient and um, um, scan them after a month or six months or nine months, you will see those changes. And uh, you these patients are usually symptomatic for not a, very long period, there is a resorptive phase when they are most symptomatic, and then it clears out. So again, you know, for patient edu education and uh, uh, to um, um, understand uh, what type of problem uh, is causing the symptoms is very important. Uh, I have a question from Janine. Where's the bursa? Let me show you here first in this view. So this is head of humerus, right? The rounded surface. This is GT greater tubercle kind of looks like little flat here probably maybe some old partial tear that happened uh, so this you can see the tendon looks normal in echo texture you can see the fiber parallel arrangement here just above the tendon almost the same thickness you see this is um, heterogeneous structure here this is bursa and above that hypochoic deltoid muscle is dark yes and um, this is Janine. Can you go back to the original view and look at uh, oh. the one before oh, no, that? You, okay, I see what you're asking. Here you cannot see the versa <laughs> because right. the calcium is blocking everything. You can only see deltoid. Because I would have thought that hyperechoic area was the bursa. So how would you differentiate because the normal uh, one? Calcification was in bursa and the tendon. Because see, when it's clear, you cannot say anything for sure in, in, in this stage, at this stage especially. Mm -hmm. um, because the, probably the bursa is also calcified with the tendon. You only see the deltoid and you see the calcific deposit, but let's go to the next one. You can see, you see a little bit specks of calcium here, a little bit um, mm -hmm. small hyperechoic dots, and then a bigger amorphous um, collection here. So there, so that calcium was in bursa also. So you cannot see the bursa because the calcium is lining it. Um, so it's not clear in that view. And here you can see it again. Now the bursa calcific um, deposit has cleared up, but you can see a little bit in the tendon substance now. So yeah. Is so there any way to look at like the normal ver next to that initial pathology so that we can compare? Uh, otherwise, so in the normal view, the, the bursa sac comes up as a hyperechoic. That's true, yeah. It just hyper so, interface. So how would we then differentiate, like, oh, that's not a bursa, that's a calcification? You can. You can, because remember, we don't just get two views. When you're scanning, you can get more than two. Uh, so I here I picked only two images, but what you when you scan, you go from long head to subscan mm -hmm. to supra. And you, we don't just stop with one long axis and one short axis. You scan, you go from, uh, so you move your probe medial to lateral to scan the width of the tendon and then anterior to posterior to scan the length of the tendon. And that's mm -hmm. when you see uh, adjacent structure. So you look at where the bone is, where the bone margins are, where the muscle is, and uh, then you can you can tell with that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if you give someone just one view or two view, it's it's hard to say. Mm -hmm. Whoever was doing the scan, they know better than anyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because these decisions are made like real time, like EMG. You know, you you you're doing you're making decisions real time. You're changing the protocol. You're picking different nerves or muscles or doing something else. Uh, so is true for ultrasound. That that's why um, uh, you you won't find too many. Um, just a snog, like, you know, you have so many OBGYN and echo uh, sonographers. I think a clinician does a better job. That's why so many sports medicine doctors are doing it. And um, there, it is a great tool. It's a powerful tool in the hands of clinician. I, I believe that. 
it's it's hard to find musculoskeletal uh, sonographer it's very hard because you know you have to know anatomy so well you have to clinically correlate it because you may find something but it may not be relevant to the patient okay moving forward okay now this is uh, roy's patient now this is a patient with full thickness tear with no loss of movement so um, to give you um, overview of this uh, of the structures here uh, this is uh, uh, probably let's assume it's a left shoulder I don't know which shoulder was this but you see a chromium here and then you see the GT here and head we don't see well there is no supraspinatus attached but look at the movement pay attention to the movement so look at this a chromium GT uh, something that where supraspinatus should be and this is deltoid here now look at the movement. Right, so now you can see initially, uh, if you remember the first normal uh, clip that I showed you, uh, you see some movement was initiated here. So it gives you an illusion that probably uh, some fibers of supra are intact, but because you know we have other views and you know we have uh, short axis, long axis, and other complete views of shoulder, we know that supra is not intact. But when you see movement, looks like as if supraspinatus is initiating some movement and then you have deltoid taking over. So look, look at the movement. So humerus is going more inferiorly then sliding under the chromium if you if you pay attention right and then deltoid is kicking in much earlier right so now because we did not scan um superior capsule rotator cable but that's one of the structure that's responsible for normal functioning uh, of the shoulder preserving the uh, stability of the shoulder uh, when supraspinatus is absent so a lot of orthopedic surgeons, when the uh, so rotator cuff is irreparable, so the quality is uh, degenerated, there's fatty infiltrations that you cannot repair the um, rotator cuff, they repair the superior capsule and rotator, uh, the rotator cable area. And that's because, now this is a clip from AOS, American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. So they are showing the significance of superior capsule. And I think that's the reason why that patient still has normal functioning, full range of motion, because that patient this has. This is a right shoulder posterior portal, and you'll notice that after arthroscopic removal of the rotator cuff, the native superior capsule maintains the humeral head well centered on the glenoid. Hmm. This is also seen in the same shoulder after gross dissection and removal of all the surrounding muscles. However, after removal of the superior capsule, there is gross instability of the glenohumeral joint. Yeah, so you will see some of the patients um, with full thickness, complete tear of supraspinatus, but you'll be surprised that they are giving you full range of motion. So they don't have any range of motion limitation, but when you do their scan, you're surprised or oh, they don't have supraspinatus. How are they moving? So because probably they have their superior capsule and, rotate, and rotator cable intact, which is maintaining the head within the glenoid. And uh, so that's another important uh, point to note when you're scanning this patient and clinically correlating your findings. So not every full thickness, complete tear of supraspinatus is going to be um, uh, empty can positive or um, with functional limitation or a range of motion, significant range of motion limitation. This is a right uh, shoulder. Okay, done with that. Let's go to the next one. Okay, another patients from a uh, patient from Roy. Now this patient uh, has full thickness tear, but this one has altered mechanics. So although I did, I, you know, Roy did this test and he sent me this clip, but I know how, what this uh, patient's abduction looked like. He was more like shrugging than um, actually moving into. So he was probably going into more lateral deviation because now look at the bony landmarks here. So this is a chromium. This is humerus, so you don't even see GT here. You see humerus and GT and uh, head of humerus are somewhere here. So the distance between acromion and humerus has decreased significantly. And these are all, this uh, This is all deltoid here. Now look at the movement. 
and you see the patient is probably laterally moving, uh, uh, laterally deviating and not giving any, any glenohumeral movement. So there is no glenohumeral movement. It's like entire scapular region is moving. Uh, so this is that patient that gives you um, lateral deviation of the trunk uh, when you ask them for abduction. So let's look at, look at this again. A chromium, and it's hard to keep probe in place because this patient is probably moving as a whole and not giving any glenohumeral movement. So you can see a chromium and humerus is almost moving as a whole, as a unit. There is no relative movement between a chromium and the humerus. And look at the uh, distal end of a chromium. Uh, so many degenerative changes, uh, cortical irregularities and um, so the bone doesn't look nice and smooth. So this is this is a full thickness tear with altered mechanics. So sometimes you know patients can trick you with the different um, compensation, but if you add imaging, you can um, say with confidence if something is uh, moving well or not. Hey, now another thing to important point to note is there there are asymptomatic rotator cuff tears. So we don't want to be we don't want to become what MRI is for lower back pain. Like you scan someone and then you give them, label them with a disc disease or something um, because they, it may not correlate with their symptoms. So even with uh, in imaging, rotator cuff imaging can be ultrasound or an MRI, there is a prevalence of rotator cuff tear, uh, especially uh, with the uh, progressive, uh, progressing age. So 60 to 80 year old, there is 25% prevalence of full thickness rotator cuff tear. More than 80 year old, there is 50% prevalence of full thickness rotator cuff tear. And this includes symptomatic and asymptomatic. So especially in uh, older population, if you're scanning them, there are certain changes in the tendon or the soft tissue around the shoulder that are going to be just a normal age um, normal finding for that age pro progression. Uh, so you have to keep that into mind. Uh, whatever finding you, uh, positive findings you have, abnormal findings on ultrasound or any other test or imaging, you have to clinically correlate that and uh, not just label patient with something uh, uh, just because you, they, you found something abnormal. Now, neural pathology, uh, we are almost towards the end. <laughs> um, like any other peripheral nerve entrapment or neural pathology, you will see neural swelling, nerve swelling, focal changes in the caliber of the nerve. Uh, if it innervates some muscles, then you will see muscle atrophy uh, or a space occupying lesion in close proximity. So this is what atrophy looks like. Uh, so this is a short, um, short axis view. So Yellow is showing the, the yellow rectangle, yellow, yellow box is the transducer. So you're, you're looking at the short axis view of infraspinatus and teres minor. Patient with suprascapular neuropathy, infraspinatus is hyperechoic and teres minor is, is relatively hypoechoic. So when there is atrophy of the muscle, it is it loses its uh, uh, hypoechoic uh, echo texture. And the, this can be subtle. And if, if you have a patient and you want to image that, uh, make sure you pick the exact same point and you can do a side-to-side -side comparison because you don't always have a nerve pathology where you can have two adjacent nerve uh, muscles supplied by different nerve. Um, here you can have a comparison between infraspinatus and teres minor because the teres minor is supplied by axillary nerve and infraspinatus is supplied by suprascapular nerve. So you can see the difference or you can do a side-to-side -side difference. But make sure you pick the same exact location for comparison and same pressure. So everything should be same. The placement of the patient, uh, location of your probe placement, and the pressure uh, and the setting of your ultrasound. This is These are the two places where suprascapular nerve can get entrapped. At the suprascapular notch or spinoglenoid notch. Spinoglenoid is if you scan infinitus and go back, where you find the glenoid labrum. If you focus on the groove just next to it, that's where the um, spinoglenoid notch is. So this is the ultrasound image of uh, spinoglenoid. So here going from, so this first blue box is uh, aligned with infraspinatus and then moving 
over to the spinoglenoid notch, a little bit more medial, and you can turn the color Doppler on. There will be an artery, just next to an artery, you will see the nerve in the groove here. Now it's a deeper structure, so you can see I have used, I have a um, trapeze function in my linear probe, so that gives me a little bit more depth. Um, I wouldn't want to use the curvilinear because that only gives you three to five megahertz, so that may not be enough to see the nerve. It's a very small nerve, um, and you need a lot of practice to look for this nerve. Um, now, a suprascapular is you go on the superior aspect, put the probe across. So your probe is aligned with the coracoid process, and you are uh, over the uh, suprascapular notch here. Again, you turn the color Doppler, you find the artery, and this is the nerve. It's not an easy nerve to see. It's a small nerve. And in this area, the nerve is in a um, right under that band and around a fatty tissue. So this is like a, it's sitting in a fatty cocoon. So it's hard to um, see. Uh, the echo texture are of the uh, neural margins and uh, the surrounding tissue are very similar. So it, it's hard to differentiate. But you know, with practice, you'll be able to pick this nerve. Uh, but you know, it's not something like a median nerve or ulnar nerve, so it's not easy to see. Um, okay, now almost last two slides uh, left. Uh, brachial plexus. So here, um, that's anterior scalene, and this is middle scalene. And between them, if you can see here, that's C5, C6, C7, C8. T1, so brachial plexus coming out. So this is where the probe is here. Patient in neuralgic amyotrophy or Arsenich Turner syndrome or acute brachial neuritis, you can notice swelling of the nerve roots. So you can see C5 and C6 uh, nerve roots swollen. So on the left is the normal image, right is the normal image. Um, so especially uh, uh, some um, pathology where there is inflammatory pathology, uh, there is demyelination or um, swelling. Uh, any type of demyelinating usually leads to some type of swelling in the uh, nerve. There is also endoneural edema. So you can see the swelling here. Uh, so that's that's what you can observe with the brachial plexus. Uh, if someone has thoracic outlet, you can scan this area for any anomaly or any... Um, focal changes in the nerve roots. Okay, so why do we do, um, why do we use EMG or ultrasound? Why do we add? Why uh, are we doing it at all? That's because when you do physical examination, a good physical examination, and nothing can replace a good physical examination and special testing, but when you add these tools, you have better understanding of the problem which leads to better management. And there are studies supporting that for both EMG and ultrasound. Uh, and this has been consistent throughout. Now there have been only two or three studies. Now we have our own hard study coming out soon. It's in review right now. And we show that 60%, more than 60% of the patient, in the more than 60% of the patients, we change the management of the patient by using these tools, EMG and ultrasound. Uh, so you are making some change, not that you're doing these tests and nothing is changing at all in the management of the patient. And patient education is the most important uh, component of it. When you have, uh, when you have better knowledge about what's going on with the patient, and you educate the patient, uh, the patient has more satisfaction with the care provided and has greater confidence with the provider. They also show better compliance with treatment instructions, and there is improved outcomes. And uh, then we uh, we also decrease times, treatment time, and cost. So there's over. It's a win-win situation. Uh, you bring the cost down. Although the cost bringing the cost down is a little extrapolation. There we need like definite studies to show that. But I'm very confident that we do that uh, because we're using uh, we're saving the cost to the system, but not by not using uh, expensive tests and uh, not using them when they are not indicated. We are finding the indications for these tests and then using it. Um, so uh, that's the 
last slide <laughs> so that's all now after this we have neural component which uh, uh, dr brooks and uh, dr mckeven presented uh, and they presented some really good cases of uh, uh past turners and uh, um, some surprise pathologies of uh, shoulder cases where it was assumed to be uh, musculoskeletal but it turned out to be something else and I would leave it for them to present at, you know, maybe in some future presentations. Uh, okay, now let's uh, I'll welcome all. Any, any questions or any comments so far? 8.40. Hmm? Well, well Mahini, I can tell you right now, we're actually in a little bit of a fight with uh, the medical community because they think the physical therapist shouldn't be doing these tests. In fact, we have our practice act coming up, and I may have to testify at the uh, state senate hearing on our, our bill next week. So they, they don't seem to understand this importance uh, of what you've described here. Uh, you know, the the knowledge is power. Um, Are they contesting yeah. both the MSK and the mm -hmm. EMG? Well, the, the factor is, is they, they don't understand that our qualifications to do this test still. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, like I said, in my state, there's only a handful. I think there's four or five that I know of right now that are even doing the EMGs and, and less doing musculoskeletal ultrasound. But we're trying to push, you know, forward that agenda. But it, it really comes down to ignorance of the physician of what our qualifications are to do the testing and what the rigorous part of you know of achieving excellence and achieving certification in uh in our field but you know the things are going to change because there are so many things that are happening at the same time and we have some really good publications so we will have evidence to show them and uh, <clears throat> in different states there are uh, when a uh, when especially when the practice act is changing or something is changing people are uh, trying to <clears throat> amend the language of practice act and uh, I know ortho section imaging uh, special interest group is doing a lot especially for imaging privileges and uh, EDX SIG which is under Academy of Clinical Electrophysiology and uh, Wound Management mm. is do doing a lot of background work that's why you know we say when we say you become members it's like you have to be member because there are <clears throat> There are very few people who are defending our rights to to be able to do this. So we really need at, le at least minimum we can do is to become member because yeah. that, you know, you for those resources we are needed. You know, when you someone has to travel somewhere for uh, to defend your rights, they, they need that those that money, membership money to uh, for that. So. Uh, Vicky was there. Vicky was part of the meetings, and uh, she knows that she was at CSM. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a lot going on, and uh, the more members we have involved, and more people step in. Uh, if you can volunteer, that's great. But at least become member of, uh, especially these two sections, and EDX SIG and um, ultrasound SIG under the section. Right. I think across the country. Um, from what I understand, almost all the states are being questioned about our ability to do that. But um, we win way more than we lose at this point. But as Mohini said, it takes it takes money to be able to fight those battles. And so, at the very least, uh, be be members um, because you never know when your state is going to come under the the gun for it. Oh yeah. I mean, that's definitely what we're seeing right now is as we're trying to push because we're also trying to push through and lengthen our, our our time without referral which if things go as hoped for we'll be up to 42 days um 